I'm super passionate about real estate. I'm one of those people that, you know, scrolls realestate.com on the weekends for a bit of fun. So um, my job I find really empowering to actually be able to pass on some of my knowledge that I've learned, you know, on my small journey to some, but obviously large for others. Um, you know, my five years of investing. First and foremost, it's getting to work really closely with uh, people, I call them clients, with, with people yeah. on, you know, the part of their investing journey that I believe I can add value to, and that's in, you know, property deals, market analysis, financials, numbers. I love that stuff, but I, I really do love getting to know people and being part of that goal and journey um, that they're on. You're listening to Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard. Here's your host, Tabitha Bright. Hello and welcome to Property Investor Tales, stories from the front yard, where I get to speak to property investors from around Australia about their investing journey. My name is Tabitha Bright and I'm the head of coaching here at Positive Real Estate, where we help people build wealth through property. With over 8,000 clients across Australia and New Zealand, there are some incredible stories to tell, which hopefully make your investing journey that little bit easier and will inspire you along the way. So my guests today are Hayley Beavis and James Evenden, two of our property consultants here at Positive Real Estate. And along with those two fabulous talents, we have some very important news and a special announcement for you here today. So tune into the podcast and catch the latest news and enjoy my chat with Hayley and James. Hey folks, and welcome to today's podcast. Uh, today, we have a bit of a big announcement and I have with me James Evenden and Hayley Beavis. Um, hi guys, welcome. Hey Tav, how are you going? Pretty well, Hello, James. <laughs> Hello, lovely to be here. Oh, fantastic. So folks, what's happening is I have done and interviewed 46 fabulous people as part of this podcast. And uh, today we are announcing that I'm handing over the reins to these two wonderful people here whose smiling faces you can see. And Haley and James, for those of you that aren't familiar um, with what it's like to be a client of Positive Real Estate, for those of you that aren't familiar, the property consultant's job is to work very closely with the coach um, to make sure that when a client has a strategy and they're going to buy a property, that the right property is matched with that client, price point, market, result, um, anything else that might be part and parcel of that client's strategy to get them a fantastic result. So these guys are very property and market specific and really, really know their stuff around investment real estate. So awesome to have you both here today. Tell me really quickly, why do you guys work as property consultants? Hayley, what is it about being a property consultant um, that you know you really love about your role? Yeah, so I'm super passionate about real estate. I'm one of those people that, you know, scrolls realestate.com on the weekends for a bit of fun. So um, my job I find really empowering to actually be able to pass on some of my knowledge that I've learned, you know, on my small journey to some, but obviously large for others, um, you know, my five years of investing, being able to apply that knowledge, pass on that knowledge, and obviously educate people on how to make some really good choices when buying real estate is, you know, I think one of the, the best parts of the job. I also love digging down deep into obviously the, the property deals and what makes a good property deal. So, you know, looking at the floor plans, love that. I think some of the coaches say that's, you know, where I shine. So I love looking at <laughs> the detail of the deals as well, um, understanding the property itself, the location and so forth. And obviously being able to help you guys make really cool um, and educated decisions when buying real estate. And, it, and it's interesting, Hales, that you say your small journey on property investing. Um, mm. Let me be really crystal clear. Both James and Haley, I have interviewed um, as part of the podcast series because they've both had really fascinating stories as part of their investing and 
Hayley, you are, let me get this right, 28 years old? I am 28 years 28 old. 28 years old, I want to get that right. <laughs> and you already have five properties behind you, you and your partner, Corey, have five properties, correct? That's it. Yeah, I think last time when you uh, interviewed me, we'd um, just purchased number four potentially. Um, and we settled on our home, which is property number five, two weeks ago and actually moved in. So very, very yeah. exciting times. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So you've been, you've done the whole journey from your principal place of residence right through to four investment properties all by the age of 28, which is yes. um, freaking awesome. So congratulations. Uh, so a wealth <laughs> of <awesome>. knowledge <laughs> outside of your role as well. And James, over to you. Um, what do you love about your job? Uh, thanks, Tab. Yeah, listen, first and foremost, it's getting to work really closely with uh, people. I call them clients, with, with people yeah. on, you know, the part of their investing journey that I believe I can add value to, and that's in, you know, property deals, market analysis, financials, numbers. I love that stuff, but I, I really do love getting to know people and being part of that goal and journey um, that they're on. But I, I like the time frame of that. For me, I, I like things that are sort of open-ended forever. So, you know, looking at where a client's at and the next property transaction and that deal and the numbers and all that that may encompass, whether it's a, you know, a two-month or three-month maybe DD process and seeing what's coming through, or helping them through that transaction and then through to completion. I just love that sort of time frame. Oh, that, that's awesome. And so, so we're crystal clear for everybody. Um, <laughs> you'll still, still see me around the traps. I'm not going anywhere. But these two fabulous talents are going to be uh, sharing many of the stories because they're working one-on-one -on -one in a far more direct way than I do with clients. Um, they're on the ground. They're in the trenches with everybody. And, um, and our best place to really share with you folks um, the myriad of stories that we see here at Positive Real Estate, you know, the bumps, the war stories, the successes, the wins um, that these guys come across on a daily basis. Um, yeah, so welcome to the podcast team. Um, I am honoured to hand over and to leave it in your very capable hands. Thank you, Tab. And I think it would only be fitting to actually turn the tables on you in this episode. And I'm sure that there's a lot of questions that, you know, people want answered because you've spent your time over the past 46 episodes really getting to know clients um, and, you know, some of the staff members and so forth or team members, yep. I should say. But now it's time to get to know a little bit about you. Um, uh -huh. I know you quite well, of course. Um, but I think that some of your knowledge and obviously background in property and even personal development is going to be really interesting yep. for some. So firstly, let's kick it off with, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background. Where have you come from um, personally and professionally? Um, what, tell us a little bit about you. <laughs> well, I don't know how far I should go. <laughs> How far do you want me to go back? All, all the oh, way, no, Tab, all the way. We want all the oh, nitty-gritty. No, no, not all the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well, all right. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet, but I um, I was a bit of a troublemaker. I got uh, kicked out of high school, actually. I wouldn't and, believe it. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know what to do, so I thought the next best thing with my teenage brain was I thought I'd get married. So I got married at 18 and um, inherited a fabulous stepson, Jasper, who I love and adore to this day, who has recently just actually made me a grandmother. But um, what it meant essentially was I worked out really quickly what I didn't want. I don't think, um, you know, when sometimes you make these rash decisions, you can find yourself in a place where <laughs> it's not actually going to serve you long term. Um, and I realized that maybe some of the decisions I made when I was at that formative age in my early, early 20s and, and late teens weren't going to serve me long term. Um, and I started a bit of a journey of self-development. So what was I going to do with my life? What did it look like? If this is not what I wanted, then what do I want? And it and having a child early, I had my own daughter, Amber, early, forced me to really 
take responsibility whereas a slightly troublesome teenager I had probably been a bit um a bit loose in that space so I found myself in the banking industry so I've done everything in banking from customer service to head teller to you name it I was forced to stay on as a teller until I balanced the books and uh, and it taught me a lot about budgeting, about money, about understanding the banking system. Um, and then I've done a raft of stuff from advertising, graphic design. Um, I've worked in those industries. Um, I've worked for the Historic Places Trust. I've been a tour guide. I've worked in nightclubs, like you name it. I pretty much an <laughs> insurance industry, but I settled definitely for my passion with real estate. Um, and I've been with positive real estate the last 15 years. So very I love hearing this and I would love to, I'm going to jump in Hales, because I just, I want to know more about my goodness, a teenage marriage. <laughs> I love it. My I'm mother so... wore black to the wedding, James. <laughs> oh my goodness. There you go. Well, that is a true can... story. Really? Okay. Well, there you go. I, I would love to keep going down this rabbit hole, but I want to know um, the crossover and with a, a varied career, like many of us had, right? Teens and twenties are not easy. You are you going to no. make money and try and Especially find in the eighties? The, 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 right? We'll leave that door shut. The right. crossover into real estate was were you? Did you get the job first? Did you invest first? Where was the, where did Jason right. Witten and Perry and investing come into your life? Yeah, well, uh, the first bit of real estate I ever bought was my principal place of residence when I was 21. And my husband and I being, um, you know, young and silly, we didn't have a lot of money. We, I didn't have any qualifications. I worked part-time for the Historic Places Trust and I had a baby and um, my husband was in some kind of random sales. And so we were young, silly, not a lot of money with children. And so we had $5,000 to our name when we bought our first house. So back in the late eighties, when this was going on, lending was very different. And it was back in the days where there were house and land builders that would work with certain valuers to overvalue a property so that you didn't have to put down the full deposit. So they would then lend you 90% or 95% of whatever that valuation was. And this is why today we have things like Valex, right? Where you don't get to choose your valuer. It's a highly regulated system. But back in those days, this particular land developer and builder worked with a dodgy valuer to overvalue property. So we had $5,000 and we were told we didn't need any more. So we bought our first, we bought our first home for $130,000 in the suburb of Karori in Wellington, New Zealand. And it was valued at more. So we only had to put in the $5,000. And um, it was, uh, look, it, it was a fine, fine house. It, it did the job. Um, long story short, my husband and I split up. We sold the house. I wanted a fresh start and I moved to Australia. I got a call about six months into being in Australia from a man that identified himself as a detective from the fraud squad in, um, in New Zealand. <laughs> and he was very quick to say, listen, you're not in trouble, but we are investigating um this the director of the company that you purchased through um because they had some scheme where they were overvaluing all of these houses and getting people dodgy finance and people were going up against the wall because in those days of course interest rates were like 13 14 15 plus percent and people couldn't afford the mortgages so they were they didn't have, you know, they should never have been given finance, people like myself. It was just we split up and divorced and sold the property. So it was sorted. And we were lucky. We actually managed to sell it for exactly what we bought it for. Um, so we were very, very fortunate. Um, it just happened to work out that way. But for a lot of people, um, they were left high and dry with negative equity. And the fraud squad um, packed that fellow off to 
um, off to jail. So that was my first foray into the property market. I am fascinated by that. It, it's just made me think really, I mean, my first home I bought, my wife and I, we were young and, yeah. and we had a baby. A baby was on the way. It's often the way, right? And yeah. we had no idea. And I do believe no someone just said, speak to my friend, you'll get a home. And we're like, wow, okay. And I think we probably pulled money from behind the couch. Like it was almost that. And within a month we had a house. So and that was without going too much into it, it was the heady days pre-GFC in Las Vegas. So um, it's funny, you and I both have stories of like, well, come on, don't you want a home type uh, scenarios. Um, continuing on from there then too, so you're in Australia, you've had, you've gotten out with a good lesson, we'll call it. Um, Worn off property of forever. And Sworn off property. Yeah. Off property. Never yep. going to have but anything to do with property ever again. There we go, famous last words. And until what you answered an ad in the paper, we're going back to the some point, the ad in the paper, did you see a magazine? How did positive real estate come across your desk? Well, my current husband, who we call my best husband so far, he's um, he calls himself that, by the way. I didn't come up with that. But um, no, we, and just so everyone knows, we have been together well over 25 years, I think now. So he's a, he's a keeper. He was, um, <laughs> he, I have to give him credit where credit is due because he introduced me to two books, The Magic of Thinking Big, which is an old one that used to be used by um, um, a lot of um, companies that were doing self-development and Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he said, we have to look at property. Like if we are going to have choices and options, we have to consider property because neither of us like shares. We'd gone and done a course, didn't sit with us. You know, you find something that you gravitate towards. Um, and so, um, yeah, we ended up, I ended up reading those two books and I started researching and looking for positive cash flow property in the late 90s in Australia. And I thought, well, I don't want to go out to a mining town. I'm not comfortable. I'm not familiar with mining towns. They were big at that time. Uh, and I thought, well, what am I going to do? Um, I'll look for a 10% yield in Melbourne. I'll look for a 15% yield in Sydney. And um, how do you reckon that went for me? Pretty damn shite. So, <laughs> so what, because I was chasing cash flow positive property, which is what Robert Kiyosaki talks a lot about. And it's where I think we gravitate towards when we first start looking at investing. We want the certainty of cash flow, right? Um, and then from there, I started putting ads in the newspapers because it was newspapers. There wasn't a lot of internet around. So it was really about, um, I buy houses, <laughs> you know, if you're in trouble, I'll, I'll make you an offer. I buy houses cheap. Um, and because we were cashed up and ready to go. And, um, and we were looking to get big discounts. Um, that unfortunately didn't work in Melbourne. And I came across Jason Witten's ad, positive real estate, because I was looking for positive cash flow property. <laughs> and, um, and I got on his emailing list. And it took me, I reckon about 12 months before I rocked up for an information night <laughs> and I sat outside on the night that we went it was at the some hotel in Melbourne and Vin and I had a big day at work and we sat outside and I said you know what I don't think I can be bothered going tonight um, and Vin was like well come on we're here um, we may as well go in I was like all right I was thinking we'll go get takeout and go home and watch a video but um, a DVD or something but uh, no Vin dragged me kicking and screaming up to that night and um, I became a client of positive real estate not long after that love it there you go and, and obviously it's progressed pretty far from there how long have you been at positive for tab 15 years 15 years. Wow, 15 years. that's um, quite the journey, isn't it? It is. And um, previous to that, you were a client initially, right? Or is that part of the 15 yeah. years? Uh, no, I was a client um, for about probably 18 months prior to that. Yeah, wow. 
Yeah. So it's been a pretty long journey with positive. Obviously, Tab knows positive better than any of us on this screen here um, being here this long. So that's pretty awesome. Um, another question for you then, you know, coming off the back of all of that, um, what has been your biggest lesson in real estate? Obviously, you've yep. you've talked to a lot of people over the years. Um, you've yep. probably how long's your journey been in real estate first and foremost and what's been your biggest lesson so far? Yeah, um, great questions, Hale. So um, prior to joining Positive Real Estate, uh, Vin and I actually joined because we needed to understand the Australian market. We understood the New Zealand market because that was where we'd grown up. And um, we had gone out prior to buying in Australia. Um, we had our family home already in Australia at that point. Um, but we'd started investing in, um, in New Zealand. So we'd given up on trying to find positive cash flow property in Australia. And we headed back to New Zealand, which was what we knew. And my biggest lesson was around in the early days was around chasing cash flow because I was so fixated on making sure I had positive cash flow and positive cash flow yields and that property didn't cost me anything on a month by month um, basis that I traded my capital growth for my cash flow. So Vin had a business and we were getting some nice profit from that. So we were taking that cash and we were putting it into property. And so we bought a number of properties in New Zealand, mostly in a student town called Dunedin that, well, it's not only a student town, it's a beautiful town, but it has a large proponent of um, students that like to run riot. And, but it had some really good yields. So we bought property that had 15% yields, 18% yields, um, which sound amazing, right? <laughs> That's some but, big yields. <laughs> yeah, it, they are big yields. But the thing about Dunedin is, and this is where you have to do your homework, everything is good value dependent on its relation to its own market. Yeah? So I was looking at Dunedin in compared to Melbourne, that you can't compare it like that. I needed to look at the property I was buying in Dunedin compared to the rest of the market of Dunedin. So I paid too much for the property because the yield still looked good for me. So I was buying it based on the yield. Um, I, didn't, um, I didn't do my research in a lot of detail. So I didn't understand that the expenses were higher in, in New Zealand. So there were things like um, two sets of rates. You pay rates to the Dunedin City Council and the Otago Council. So that was double the rates and rates are more expensive than they are here in um, Melbourne. So I was looking at around four to five grand in rates at the time per property. So all of this stuff started, the interest rates were higher in New Zealand. I could only get a 20% loan because I was classed as, a, as an alien um, investor because even though I was a New Zealand citizen, I was investing from Australia. So I was putting a lot more cash in so there were all of these things that chipped away at, at what would have been essentially a good deal if I'd lived in New Zealand, yeah? What that meant for me and where the lesson was, was if I'd taken that same cash and I'd put it in a property here in Melbourne, over the time frame I held those properties, instead of making 100 grand's capital growth and about five grand a year per property in cash flow, I would have made 400, 500,000 in capital growth. And that was my lesson. Yeah. So yes, it would have, it would have maybe have cost me five or 10 grand a year in holding costs because it wouldn't have been positive cash flow here in Paran and Melbourne, but I would have made that big chunk of capital growth and the yield would have caught up eventually. And I would be in double the position that I am today if I had understood the difference in investing for cash flow and investing for capital growth, yeah? So that was a really important lesson. And this is really important as we head into today's market where we see interest rates coming back to some kind of normalcy. So they're not high interest rates, they're just some kind of normalcy. And I think people have forgotten what that even looks like because there's been have. You know, two years of seeing interest rates go so low that people think that that's normal now. <laughs> they do. They do. A hundred percent. And this is where it's really easy 
to let fear and our psychology around investing impact us and get in the way of us getting results because we overweight a fear we may have as a market changes, but we have to compare it to what? Compare it to the context that on average over the last 20 years, interest rates have probably been 7%, but we're so used to and conditioned to having you know, 2% interest rates that anything above 4% feels scary. But we need to make sure we do our research and we understand how to mitigate and protect ourselves in these instances, but still take um, advantage of opportunity because your long-term capital growth, investing well and wisely, your rents will outpace your negative cash flow within a five to seven year time frame usually. So it's just about protecting yourself for those initial few years. And that's really my best top tip for making sure you succeed with your investing. Yeah. I love hearing that tab and I think I'm going to have to rewind and rewatch. So your, just to, to, just your number one top tip for investing was? <laughs> my number one top tip for investing is don't get caught up on cash flow. It is the lifeblood of your portfolio. Yes, in that it enables you to manage your cash flow, manage to run your business. But where you create your wealth is with your long-term capital growth. So the 15 year plus trajectory of holding property is where your wealth is created. Your cash flow is the short-term stuff to enable you to service and look after your portfolio. Yeah. I love it. No, I thought, and you and I have had this conversation before and I've asked you, right, if you could do it all again, what would you do different? My blue what chip. Would you do the same. <laughs> and you said that exactly. Just yep. my blue chip. My blue and chip so, and start early. Start early. Well, we'll that's start as early as you can. Can't wind back those hands, but um, blue chip. Um Good quality. Yeah, Dunedin yeah. versus Melbourne, I can see where which one's going to come out on top. What about um, through your, because I know you've had a, a diversified portfolio across Australia. Um, would that apply then here? I know you've had Sydney. Um, you know, would you call your, yeah. your Sydney blue chip, was that blue chip or is Sydney by default because of the size? Is that what you're talking about? Because yeah, some so of us are in different areas and smaller spots and I have been... I've chased yield and sort of that immediate equity that I tried to get before um, yeah. and ended up in regional um, yeah. and foregoing major city capital growth that, you know, so be it. You've got to learn those yeah. lessons. But um, yeah. what about Australia? Um, so Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria are where I hold my portfolio in Australia. Um, and um, New South Wales not only... Um, did I have Sydney, so a major capital city, but I also had regional New South Wales. Um, and that, there were some lessons in that. I'm sorry, I've actually forgotten what your question was. <laughs> uh, just relative then. It's clear for us to see, okay, Dunedin, small New Zealand, uni town with 18% yields versus Melbourne, right? Yeah. Um, which one would probably play out for cap growth? What about in Australia? Did the oh, same Melbourne, sort of yeah, 100 why is, is there, you know, yeah, listen, the bigger the city, the closer to the, the heartbeat and, and those blue chip suburbs is where you'd put your money? Yeah. yeah. Well, look, you know, at the risk of sounding like the company spokesperson, I, I follow Sam Saggers. Like, um, he's yet to ever put me wrong. Um, so major capital cities, um, it's where the most opportunity generally is. It's where the pressure is. Um, absolutely, you will have... Um, individual hotspots that happen often people jag by luck but if you're trying to make a, a quality decision you're looking at the best quality property that you can afford to purchase um, for your circumstances and service um, because servicing sometimes also means that you can like the higher the yield the more you can potentially borrow as well so there's always a little bit of juggling which is why um, coaching and planning and all of that stuff is uh, valuable. Um, but yeah, the major capital cities, Eastern Seaboard is where I've always found a lot of success. I know Sam's talking about Perth at the moment as opportunity comes there, but major capital cities is where a lot of the pressure is. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. 
Yeah, but do tune into Sam's podcast. I'll plug that because he goes into a lot of detail about that stuff. And so for those of you that love the data and the information and the education, Sam's podcast is a second to none. Yeah. So saying that, Tab, with um, obviously your advice being buy blue chip, what yep. has been your most memorable deal that you've purchased over the years of investing? Yes. Um, and why? Not a, and blue, why? <laughs> <laughs> not a blue chip one, but it was a lot of fun. So um, I liked, part of why I joined Positive Real Estate at the time was I liked learning to wheel and deal and um, put my own deals together. Um, not something we do as much of today, but certainly is an option for clients. Um, so I used to go around and I was heavily focused on strata titling blocks of units. So for the uninitiated, what that means is you buy a block of units, it might be three in a block, four in a block, um, whatever it might be. And they are, they are in what's called in one line. So you cannot sell them individually. So what I would do as the investor is I would come in and I would get them subdivided and thereby increase their value. So it's like buying bulk and then selling retail, essentially, except I wouldn't always sell them, I'd hold them. So, but I'd get them revalued, get the equity out and then have that as my profit, my buffer and my seed capital for another deal. Does that make sense? So it's like developing, but without the stress of developing, you're just doing the plans. So one of the better deals that I put together was um, a fourplex in Batemans Bay. I did a couple of deals in Batemans Bay because I had a very useful agent that used to bring me deals. Um, this particular deal, I ended up going halves on with another um, friend of mine. So I set up the deal and managed it. So what it was, was four townhouses in Batemans Bay in one line. Um, individually, they were worth about a million dollars as all four, because it was cheap as chips back then. Because um, it was back in, yeah, it, late 90s. Um, I secured them for 700000 and I secured them because I was buying all four. So there's usually a discount. I um, also secured them with the conditions that the owner would strata title them for me. What that meant was, so I didn't settle them. So what that meant was I went to contract on 700,000 to be... Um, settled once the strata titling was complete. That meant that I could then go and set, get finance on every single townhouse as an individual finance. And I could get them, and I could get that finance on their end value. So on their new increased value. So essentially, I didn't have to put in any cash into the deal because the end valuation was so much higher that I did essentially a no money down deal. And it took eight months for the, for the vendor to start a title them. So I had no holding costs during that time. It didn't eat into my profit. They went through the motions because they were keen to sell it. They valued in higher. I settled the deal and I ended up with equity of 90K in my pocket as well um, after settling the um the property deal and putting no money down. So it was pretty cool. I'm sure that the um the outgoing buyer would have been spewing that they didn't actually just go through that process themselves and sell them singularly. <laughs> yeah. Well, people ask me, why would they do that? And at the time, um, there was a push from government that you could um, roll money like a million dollars into super. And they were hoping to do that. But when they were halfway through the process, it actually took too long and they ran out of time. So they weren't able to do that. The other thing that happened was you can be gazumped in New South Wales. And, and what that means is somebody else can come and take the deal off you if you're not unconditional. And I was not unconditional. And so what that meant was that the, um, the real estate agent, and this is why you never, ever, ever, this is another top tip, you never buy, um, you never sell your property with the person you bought it off. Yeah. The agent that I used to buy off came to me when this person was selling their units and they said, Tab, we've, we're getting another offer in, in 24 hours. If you don't go unconditional before I get this offer in for 20, in, in 24 hours, I'm going to have to present them the offer. So she was working for them 
and had another offer coming in 100K more than what I had, I was going through the process with them for. Cash in hand, government buyer going to buy all four units. And she didn't present it to them because she knew I was going to keep buying off her. I would never sell through her. And that was unethical. And I won't name names. But <laughs> I, got a, I got a deal and went unconditional and got it 100 grand and they were never the wiser. So you have to be, um, you have to be really careful in that space. So that was my yeah, most we, memorable day. They are tails investor. What are we doing? This is property <laughs> investor tails. Oh my God, we have opened the lid. Oh, I feel like we could talk about this for all day, actually. Tab, oh, yeah, I've got a few more up my sleeve, but we'll, maybe we'll save them for another day. If ever you feel like you need to roll me out again, you can. <laughs> Not so sure we'll roll you out, but definitely we will have you. Well, here's us saying we'll have you back. This is your podcast, and we it's have ours to, now, James. What are you talking? It's about? yours now, my friend. Yeah. Bless us with a, uh, a, a a pinch of um, a pinch of wisdom and some top tips here, and some dirt and some juiciness that we all love to have. So uh, thank you. As a past agent. Um, you, I want to go back and explore more on that topic. That is, oh uh, yeah, totally unethical. I mean, nothing to do with oh, me. It was, her, yeah. But I would never ever have sold anything through her. But I bought a lot through her. Mm. Oh well, we're, we're loving hearing that. So thank you. Awesome. Well, um, all right, guys. Uh, this is really my swan song and um, saying to everyone that I interviewed, um, to you two that are taking over, a massive thank you for being part of the podcast to date and that it is in fabulous hands with um, these two rock stars and I know they're going to do a wonderful job and do it so much justice. And make sure that you reach out um, to any of us via Facebook Messenger, your coach, if you would like um, to be interviewed for the podcast. Um, it's amazing uh, how often we underestimate our stories and what value we add to other people. So don't be shy, folks. Don't think it's not worthy. Um, there's a whole heap of tips and information and just people wanting to understand that what they're going through is what everyone's going through. So um, make sure you reach out to this wonderful team. That's it from me for now. Welcome, James Haley. Um, uh, that's it for today. Sounds great. Thanks, Tad. Thanks, it's folks. Been awesome. It's been awesome here and awesome listening to all of your property investor tales. And um, we look forward to obviously taking the reins. Chat to you all soon. Thanks, <laughs> See you, folks. Hey, thanks for listening to Property Investor Tales. Remember to subscribe so you get notified every time a new episode drops. As you can guess, I love hearing people's property investor tales. So if you'd like to share yours, then please get in touch with me via email at propertyinvestortales at positivementor.com.au. We would also love your feedback and I would appreciate a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Remember, you can watch all of these podcasts over on YouTube at Positive Mentor or at positivementor.com.au. Until then, take care, happy investing and 